Hello everyone, uh, I'm Davide, and today I'm going to be talking about Master Slave and Sharding with Doctrine together or less. Uh, this is going to be kind of a case study. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be discussing our application, Nuvola, how it, it evolved through the years, uh, what were our needs, how we faced them. Uh, it's going to be rather on a high level. I will not go too much into the implementation details. It's a lot of content and kind of difficult to present it in a setting like this one. So I plan on publishing a blog post more focused on the actual code. So look forward to that if you're interested. Uh, and I think, I uh, want to be honest, I'm not really a huge expert on the topic. The real hero is a colleague of mine who did most of the work. Uh, so if you do have any questions, just get in touch with me. I will get you in touch with him. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I've been a PHP developer for quite a while, uh, 12 years. I actually worked on all the major Symfony versions starting from 1.0. Uh, I was actually part of the team who translated the Symfony 1.0 documentation into Italian. We published some books back in the day. Uh, please add through this documentation to your methods. It's really important, never forget about them. Uh, about Microsoft, which is my company, uh, we work remotely, which is very nice. If you're interested, we are hiring. We uh, work on our software, uh, Nuvola, which is a Symfony application created in 2013. It's currently on Symfony 4.3. Uh, it's a web application for schools, very complex. Uh, uses AWS and MySQL as a database. We are kind of a heavy hitter. We uh, have more than a billion queries every day. So that's kind of a lot. And <laughs> that's why we try to optimize it in a lot of ways. The first one was sharding, which was introduced in 2014. So what do we mean with sharding? If you Google the term, you'll find a lot of definitions. This is what we mean with sharding. Basically, it's splitting your data into different databases. This is very simply put, uh, according to the main boundaries. For application, that would be the school, i.e. the customer. Um, our setup as one global database, because that's needed, as I will mention later, and multiple tenants, which would be the database shards. Why and why not use sharding? Well. Uh, the first reason, most important, why it was adopted is that you can scale it easily, more easily. Uh, each database is kind of independent, so if you wanted to, you could scale a single database without caring for the others. Uh, backs backups are going to be smaller and more manageable, so overall data is more manageable. Uh, it's also safer uh, because there are hard boundaries across databases, so you're kind of guaranteed that any sort of corruption will stay in one database and will not spread to the others. The major con is obviously uh, everything is way, way more complex than it should be, uh, both on the application side, on the infrastructure, and there could be a lot of manual data aggregation going on across different shards. You need to keep data synchronized, so that's also something you need to keep in mind. Other things to keep in mind when working with a sharded database. Uh, you always uh, need to remember where something is supposed to be living. Uh, it could be either in a shard, in the global database, or in both, which is kind of the worst of the three, uh, because it needs to be kept in, uh, kept in sync. If you edit something on a shard, the change has to be replicated in the master, and vice versa. So that's something you need to be aware of. Uh, Another issue is that when you're working with sharding, you are working with sharding. So even locally, uh, that's something that has to be part of your workflow. And if you make changes to one database structure, you need to reproduce the same change onto the global database or vice versa. So you need to pay a lot of extra attention. So uh, as I mentioned, our application uses Symfony and we're using Doctrine as an uh, ORM. How do you impl implement sharding using Doctrine? Well, thankfully, it has something out of the box. There are two interfaces and a connection class. 
the two interfaces are Shard Manager and Shard Chooser. Shard Manager is basically uh, a manager which works closely with the connection object and it will basically uh, update the connection depending on the configuration it is configured with. Uh, there are two groups of methods, one for directly uh, handling shard selection and another convenience one just for querying all databases. Uh, the shard chooser, on the other hand, is much simpler and it's basically uh, a function that we convert the distribution value, which is kind of the global identifier of a shard, into uh, the identifier that can be used internally by doctrine. So rather simple in implementation. Um, this is how you configure sharding using a classical Symfony application. Just a couple of services, and then you're going to tell Doctrine that it needs to use the wrapper class, which is the pulling shard connection. This comes from Doctrine. You don't need to do anything. It's out of the box. Uh, this is kind of rushed because we already talked about it. Uh, we have three articles on the topic. We also already did a presentation back in 2016. Uh, the slides are in English, the pre actual presentation is in Italian. If you're interested, uh, take a look at those. And now on to the main part, which is optimization of what we had. So uh, sharding was the first solution. A few years later, we realized we had some other issues, which is everything was kind of built to handle peak usage. Our whole infrastructure was built to be able to handle those uh, that billion queries that I mentioned. The problem with that is that the usage is not consistent throughout the day. So we have this huge peak from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., which is kind of school hours in, in Italy, and at the end of the school year. But for instance, during the night and during summertime, the usage is so low almost non-existent. So the billion queries is basically from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., which is even more impressive. The setup was rigid, so we cannot scale it down. So during the night, as I mentioned, during summertime, we were still uh, using a lot of resources that, that are able to sustain the day traffic. Lots of resources, lots of money. Uh, we were <laughs> spending way too much. Uh, so there was a lot of things we wanted to do in order to optimize this. We brainstorm a little, uh, figure out possible solutions. Uh, some of the things we thought about, uh, the first one was moving from uh, GP2 to uh, IOPS. These are two uh, storage types for the database provided by Amazon. Uh, kind of helped, but not too much, so it's not even worth discussing. Uh, we thought about some sort of database clustering, not really effective, very expensive, and we were also kind of afraid that we wouldn't have support if you needed. Um, thought about also implementing some sort, sort of proxy for split read and write queries, very difficult, very complex to set up and maintain, not really worth doing. And finally, we also thought about uh, manually optimizing our application. Uh, which, as you can imagine, is kind of inefficient. Uh, it's very error-prone, very difficult to maintain in the long term. So eventually, uh, we settle on using Amazon Aurora and its master-slave features. Uh, Amazon Aurora is basically MySQL provided by Amazon, and you can use the auto-scaling functionality, which will provide you with master-slaves for free, basically. Almost no configuration needed. Uh, just to be clear, what do we mean with master-slave? Uh, this is taken from MariaDB.com, so I'm confident it's true. <laughs> uh, master-slave replication enables data from one database server, the master, to be replicated to one or more other database servers, the slaves. The master logs the updates, which then ripple through to the slaves. Basically, this means that you're going to be writing to the slave and reading, oh, sorry, writing from the master and reading from the slave. Uh, this is kind of the extreme simplification, but just to have an idea of what this whole thing is about. You may be wondering, but you said you're using sharding. Now you're talking about 
using master slave. Are you moving to that architecture? Are you ditching sharding? Well, no, we are using both at the same time. Uh, our previous setup was working fine for us, so we did not want to change it. Uh, the problem with that is that Doctrine does not really support these two things at the same time. Uh, on the technical side, there are two different, different connection objects. One of is for master-slave and one is for sharding. You can only have one, basically. <laughs> so we had to do some changes and do it ourselves. Uh, these are some of the things we found out on the process. Uh, we were forced to extend the base master-slave connection class, and this is the reason why. This is a check that is hard-coded in some doctrine configuration file. Uh, if, did not, if we did not want to break everything, we were forced to find a way to keep that check true. So we ha had to extend the base master, sl master slave class. Uh, we also had to find a way to configure multiple hosts. Uh, this kind of more on the doctrine bundle side. Uh, it provides just one host parameter, whereas we needed two. So our solution was just to pass them as a single parameter separated by a colon sign, and in our own connection class, just handle it manually. That worked as well. Uh, another weird thing we found uh, is with schema tool, which is a, uh, a class used mainly in the migrations library. For some reason, uh, it calls execute query instead of execute update. What are these two methods? Uh, they're part of the connection class, Execute update is supposed to be sending uh, inserts, uh, deletes, and updates, of course. Whereas uh, reading queries are supposed to go through execute query. The problem with schema tool is that for some reason it was sending updates, deletes, and all of that using execute query. So when working with the master slave environment, you want, you want to be reading from the slave, not writing. and Going through execute query meant that uh, we were going to be writing onto the slaves, which was a problem. Uh, our solution to this was create uh, a patch that we maintain and we keep it locally. It gets installed during the composer install phase. Uh, we are thinking about opening a PR to fix this. To be completely honest, we are not sure if it's 100% correct. And this is the reason why we've not created the pull requests yet. Uh, it works for us, uh, but we are still kind of evaluating the impact. Uh, okay, so the main thing in this whole process was the custom connection class, which was, of course, named master slave pooling shard connection. Uh, it's basically a mix of these two connection classes that are provided by Doctrine kind of inherits everything from the master slave cl class, and then we copy-pasted what we needed from the pooling shard connection class. So kind of a mixture of both. The real customization we did was uh, overriding the instances where the connection property was accessed. Uh, so there's basically the connect method uh, where the connection object is used, and we basically changed it to use another property we call active connections, which we handle manually. Uh, it's mostly the same, just there is an extra layer using the shard ID. Uh, it works, it's not pretty, uh, it's not ideal, it works, kind of hacky. Uh, then same as earlier, uh, just to, uh, to tell Symfony to use this class, uh, you just need to set it in the wrapper class property. So these were kind of the main things we faced during the actual implementation phase. Uh, after that comes the scariest part, which is deploying this whole new thing and possibly not breaking everything. Uh, of course, we kind of wanted to break it down into smaller steps just to be extra safe. The first one was a test, because we used the custom connection class, we wanted to test that uh, we are never writing to a slave. Uh, our slaves are read-only, so that would, besides the fact that it would be bad, 
it would also not work and the code would throw an exception which would then break your application. So what we did to make sure that this was not happening was to create a special um, environment uh, for our help desk people to use. They tried it for a while. We had a lot of logging features enabled to make sure that everything was kind of being logged. Uh, we monitored those logs. And after a while, we were confident that everything was working properly. The second step uh, after that was making sure that the base scenario worked. Uh, by design, everything should work just using master. Uh, so it was a bit of weird, but our solution was simply to uh, deploy our new code onto our old infrastructure. Basically, our old infrastructure was using one database, which is the master-only scenario. They are equivalent. So we deployed the code to the old infrastructure, and effectively, it was a test to verify that this assumption was true. Step three was to test the migration to Aurora. Uh, this was kind of the first big step we took. And the way we worked around it was to move these demo environments we use. Uh, they're used by our help desk people to test new features, uh, reproduce issues when they pop up. And so we moved these demo environments to the new, uh, to the new platform. Um, same as step one, we just asked our help desk people, uh, please test them, uh, report if anything comes up. If anything is weird, just let us know. So test them, they did. And when this was all over, we were confident to move to step four, the final step which was to move everything else. And as you may imagine, you don't want to move everything at once. That would be crazy. Uh, so we just kind of took 50 shards at a time, moved them, waited a little, made sure that everything did not break, moved another 50 shards, and so on. And that was it. Uh, we were able to deploy it. Uh, it was not painful, from what I understand. <laughs> Um, but we were able to pull it off. Of course, once everything is said and done, you need to wait for issues because they're going to pop up, inevitably. Uh, the basic issues that you will find uh, in a master-slave environment kind of uh, are about the replication lag, which is the time it takes for a change to be repl replicated from master to slaves. Amazon says that it should be below 100 milliseconds, but it's more of an estimate. They're a guarantee they provide. They tell you, hey, we are pretty confident it's going to be like that, but we do not provide you any solid guarantee on the matter. Uh, there are many different ways to face this issue. Uh, a very interesting one is provided by Booking. Uh, I've linked the slides where they present this solution. Uh, it it uses waypoints. Uh, it's a super uh, solid solution, very complex, too much for us. We did not want to go down that way. So when we face this issue, which is when users will make a change to something, they get redirected to another page with a summary of what they changed. This is a writing operation that is a reading operation. So this goes to master, that goes to slave. Slave is not ready yet, does not have the updated data yet. So they will get stale data. Of course, you do not want a user to change something and then think they did not change anything. That would be wrong. Uh, our solution to work around this it was just a simple uh, event listener in Symfony. The basic idea was to think, to just assume that if anything was changed less than two seconds ago, force the current connection to master. This happens at the beginning of the request response lifecycle. Uh, when a request comes in, uh, we're going to check if there is some sort of marker, marker in the session. Uh, 
if that marker was less than hap, uh, was created less than two minutes, two seconds ago, sorry, <laughs> uh, just stick to master. At the end of the life cycle, uh, before the response is sent, we just check the current connection. We, th we say that if it's still a master, it means that something was written in this uh, requ request response life cycle. So if that was the case, we update the marker and the cycle continues. So uh, there is a theoretical risk of being stuck on master if, uh, indefinitely. Uh, if a user makes a change and then they refresh the page every two seconds or less, they are going to be using master forever. That's theoretical, so <laughs> let's just be real. It's not going to happen, um, hopefully. Um, so it was not really a concern for us. Uh, this is kind of a very pragmatic solution. Uh, it's not perfect, it's not by the book. Works for a use case and we are happy with it. Uh, by the way, this works using user sessions. Uh, we are not really concerned if a user makes a change and then another user sees stale data. Uh, we are not dealing with payments or any kind of super sensitive matter that requires that kind of synchronization. This kind of delay is acceptable in our use case, so we were fine with this uh, compromise. Uh, another problem we faced that was uh, also the result of the replication lag issue uh, was a spikes in failure rates for email and SMS delivery. So uh, how do we deal with sending emails and SMSs? Uh, we save data in the database and then we dispatch a message to a message queue telling the queue, hey, send. The problem with this uh, was that sometimes uh, the queue consumer will try to look in the database for the new data and it will not be there. It could be either because the transaction was not completed, uh, because the delay prevented the change to be replicated uh, to the slave, so the slave is not ready yet. So, as you may imagine, this is something that was kind of already there because of this uh, architecture. Uh, it was just uh, so not frequent that we did not really uh, notice it. Uh, we, uh, the failure rate was very low, so it kind of slipped under our radar. Um, the solution to this is kind of simple-ish. Uh, you, you could create some sort of artificial delay to the consumer, just wait a couple of seconds, things like this. You could implement some sort of exponential backup logic where the consumer will retry every few seconds until the message is ready, uh, the um, database is ready. There are a few ways around this. Pick the one that works best for you. So all in all, uh, are we happy with all of this thing we've done? Yes, uh, of course we are happy because we are saving a lot of money. And that was kind of the goal at the beginning, optimizing in order to save money. Uh, some things are not by the book, really. Uh, some things are kind of hacky. Everything works for us. Uh, this is something that you should always remember. You work, you code for your application. Uh, if something works for your application and it's not perfect, it's probably good enough. So always keep this in mind. Okay, so finally, what were our achievements? Uh, well, the main one for us were, is using 50% less nodes on the database side. I, every node contains database, databases, and now we're able to pack about twice as many databases <laughs> into a single node. Uh, this happens because now, uh, Every database can scale independently, so we're able to use less nodes. Uh, we could actually pack even more shards, which are databases, if, you're, if you forgot about it, uh, into a single node. We just don't want to overcrowd them. Uh, there is no reason for us to do it. Uh, it's just for peace of mind. 
uh, we are happy with the way everything works so we just choose to keep it the way it is uh, the replication lag is very low and manageable uh, the issues we found out uh, were fixable we worked around them and Amazon says it's below 100 milliseconds. In our experience, it was more like 20. Uh, there are a few spikes when a new slave is automatically created, but it's still very low. Uh, so that was something we are happy about. And we have a very reduced load on the master database, at, which is kind of the heaviest one and less optimized. So it's important to keep the uh, load off of that. Uh, we have a very permissive setup. We fall back on master very often. So even with our setup, still only about 20% of the queries end up on the master database, uh, which is very low. We are happy about it. Everything is performing well. Good result. And finally, this, was a, this is a very nice to have, I believe. Uh, our code does not really depend on AWS. Uh, our application works uh, on Aurora. It does not really have a dependency on that ven vendor. We could be moving the application anywhere else. As, uh, as I mentioned, we were able to deploy it onto our old infrastructure, which does not have a master slave setup. So we could be moving it everywhere else, and it would work fine. It was also always nice to be able to code independently from your platform and avoiding hard dependencies. And that's it. Um, I would be happy if you rated this talk. Uh, it was my first time. Lots of things I, I can improve for, for sure. Uh, take a look at our openings. As I mentioned, we work remotely. We are very nice people, mostly. <laughs> And you can find me on Twitter and GitHub. If you do have questions, as I mentioned, uh, come and talk to me. Uh, I'll answer if I can. Otherwise, I'll uh, get you in touch with people who actually do a lot on the topic. Uh, we have a, a DevOps person who is extremely skilled. He, he could not be here today, but he told me that if you are interested, you do have very infrastructure-based question. Just talk to me. I will get you in touch with him, and he'll be happy to help you. And that's it. Thank you.